Hey everyone, Charlie here. I'm taking a little vacation, so instead of your regular OCC video, I've partnered up with the environmental YouTuber Amy Maggie to spotlight one of her amazing videos. So if you like the video you're about to see, make sure to head over to her channel and subscribe. So I've divided up this video into four different sections, just to kind of make it easier to kind of understand and to focus on certain areas. So first we're going to be talking about what exactly is sustainable housing and how we think about it. And next we're going to be talking about sustainable design and location. The third part is going to be about sustainable housing technology. Some of it is super, super interesting, so definitely stay tuned for that part. And then finally, we're going to be talking about the role of government when it comes to sustainable housing, because I talk a lot about on this channel about how government regulation and government action is important for sustainability. And when it comes to sustainable housing, the government plays a huge role in specific areas. And we're going to talk about that. I also wanted to mention that I actually, when I was in university, I took a class, I think it was called like sustainable housing development and technology. So this is basically just everything I learned in that class. But but I did look back into the subject and I'm going to be linking down the articles that I read to refresh my memory and also to just share with you guys if you want to learn more about this. Anyways, <laughs> let's get into the video. So first, how do we actually think about sustainable housing? So I thought this would be a great question to kind of start out because um, it will kind of pinpoint our biases and kind of show where we are at in terms of how we imagine sustainability when it comes to housing development. And I actually want everyone to comment down below what kind of comes to mind when you think about sustainable housing. And then as we go through this video, I'm curious if your mind changes a little bit about what is a sustainable house and how we need to be thinking about it. For me personally, from what I remember taking that class and also from when I just googled sustainable housing, here are some of the things that kind of came up and it's kind of stereotypical sustainability things but just kind of put onto housing. So when you think about sustainable housing, you probably think about things like green roofs or just greenery in general, housing that is in the woods or kind of in a nature-y kind of area. You also have things like solar panels or some kind of renewable energy source connected to the building. And then also kind of more on the point of like earthiness, kind of more natural materials or having like a garden or something like that. At least when I first thought about sustainable housing before I took the class, I just imagined super futuristic looking things especially because our modern day architecture is kind of evolving towards like I guess like spaceship-esque more futuristic designs but just super elaborate things that's what I thought about when I thought about sustainable housing and when you google sustainable housing you get a lot of these like earthy futuristic like skyscrapery super interesting buildings and I'll put up pictures to show you guys what exactly I'm talking about. None of these ways of thinking about sustainable housing is necessarily wrong but I also think it's important to consider other parts of housing and development that you might not have considered when you thought about what exactly makes housing sustainable. And obviously as we go through this video I'm going to share with you guys exactly what makes housing sustainable so don't you worry but here's kind of an overview of what I believe is sustainable housing development. I'm curious if you thought of any of these things when you were considering what makes a housing development sustainable. Sustainable housing is really energy efficient and it utilizes things like a smaller area and also good insulation. And of course you have really good material sourcing, really utilizing things that are reusable or reused. Also sustainable development has minimal to no impact on the natural environment surrounding it and instead works with nature instead of working against it. When we think about sustainable development, it's not wrong to think about these futuristic super cool looking things but we should also consider more than just the design but also things like the location the size the technical things and just kind of a more holistic approach to considering what is sustainable housing on that note of holistic let's actually ditch that and get into the specifics of sustainable housing development <music> Starting with location and city planning in general. I remember this was the most eye-opening part of this class, not because it's something that's groundbreaking, but something that I just never considered. But it is the idea that living in a city is more sustainable than living in the suburbs. So I had never really considered this before, so I was kind of mind blown when we kind of started talking about location and the sustainability when it comes to a house in the city versus a house in the suburbs, for example. City living is just inherently more sustainable than suburban 
suburbia, suburban, suburb, living in the suburbs. So I love living in a big city and I'm not trying to kind of push my ideology on everyone, especially because naturally people just are migrating into bigger cities or big cities just tend to expand more than people living in smaller towns. But I do think we need to focus on making cities more livable than expanding suburbs. Seriously, why do we keep making more suburbs? I don't get it. <laughs> living in a city is just going to be more sustainable than living in the suburbs and I'm going to share with you a couple reasons why suburbs Urban life is just inherently more unsustainable than city life. So the first thing that I wanted to touch on is highways, which are a huge issue when it comes to creating suburbs because wherever there's a suburb, there's a big city that it is connected to because, you know, suburbs are kind of boring and they need to go into the city and oftentimes people live in the suburbs and then work in the city. So you need a highway to connect the two. So the issue with highways, other than being a huge resource strain to actually make and to maintain, they also contribute to habitat fragmentation. So habitat fragmentation, basically exactly as it sounds, it divides a habitat basically in two, or if you build another highway, then in four. And it just kind of makes it harder for different species to continue to intermingle. And especially if you have a species that is vulnerable and the population is really low, once you divide up the population even more, it just could, uh, Anyways, as I was saying, when you build a highway, you're basically just dividing up the habitat and this disturbs the natural environment, obviously, and it makes it harder for species to continue to intermingle. And especially if a species is vulnerable, you're making it harder for them to kind of stick together. And it contributes to a decrease in species biodiversity, which decreases the resilience of these species to be able to, you know, survive and not die off. So this is actually something that happens naturally. It's called speciation. When two species kind of become separated, this can be because of a storm or because someone just, one group finds itself in a different area and gets separated from the rest of the other animals and then they evolve separately. So technically this does happen naturally, but when we as humans are the ones separating different species from each other, we don't know how this is going to negatively impact the animals and especially at the rate that we're doing it, this could have a a kind of compounding impact on the environment is not good. So we can never really know the extent of the damage we're creating when we keep fragmenting these habitats. So that's one reason that we need to stop creating so many suburbs because we're just disturbing the natural environment. <music> So connected to the issue of highways is cars because obviously you drive highways on cars. What? You drive cars on highways. Suburbs create a dependence on cars, especially connecting people from the suburbs to the major city. And this is obviously horrible because you know, carbon dioxide, not good at all. So that's also another issue. And obviously the more people drive on highways, the more they need to be repaired. It's just not good to have such a reliance on cars. And also because of the way that a lot of suburbs are built, it's hard for public transportation to actually be any like helpful at all. So a lot of suburb, oh, sometimes I don't know English. Oftentimes the public transportation in a suburb is either non-existent or really bad, even within the suburb or, I know I keep saying suburb, but this kind of applies also to small towns. I'm from a small town. The public transportation system is not very good because of the way the city is planned. So people have a reliance on cars, which is just not good at all. So something that's super interesting when it comes to suburbs and public transportation that I've noticed here in Paris is that the obviously the Paris metro system is really good. I thoroughly enjoy it, especially coming from a small town, like I said. But one thing that is kind of an issue is the way that it it's kind of like a spider web shape. So it connects the suburbs to Paris, but it doesn't connect the suburbs to each other. If you're trying to go from one suburb to the next, you have to go back to Paris and then to the suburb. Like you go to Paris, switch trains, and then go to the other suburb. So it's just more difficult to connect suburbs. I know they are building a train in Paris that kind of those around and connect. I'll put a picture to show you guys what I'm talking about, but they're making a train to connect the suburbs, which is pretty cool. But I know in the US, this is 
would not work at all. But in general, just living in the suburbs kind of makes you rely on having a car. The more of a reliance we have on cars, just the more energy we consume. I know this is like an issue with China as like it becomes more and more developed. There's more and more of a reliance on cars and it just kind of exacerbates the issue of energy consumption and CO2 output as a country develops and starts to kind of consume things like cars. Consume is such an interesting word to use for something like cars, but um, utilize things like cars. So that's kind of a tangent, but yeah. But the reliance of suburbs on cars is just not good. So another issue when it comes to suburbs, and this one doesn't have to be, but it's just kind of inherent with the lifestyle of suburban life. And it is the fact that um, a lot of homes in suburbs are usually bigger. And like I said, this it doesn't always have to be this way, obviously, but I know especially in the US, like if you live in the suburbs, you're just going to have a bigger home. And a bigger home means that you have more home to like heat and to cool down. So that uses a lot of electricity. It means you're obviously taking up more land, which you're taking away from other animals and everything. Especially if this town is just kind of being developed, you're literally just chopping down trees to build a big old house and that's not good for the natural environment. A big home also means you have more space to fill it with things, which means you're gonna consume more just kind of naturally and honestly I've felt this too like the more space you have just the more th like my closet I, you can't see it right now but my closet is pretty darn big and at first I was like oh my god this is huge and then eventually like now it's full because I have space so I was like I'm just gonna fill it and then finally it's just a lonely kind of lifestyle. A big part about sustainability is also the impact on the social well-being of humans. Suburban life is just kind of lonely and not how humans are naturally supposed to interact with each other so I'm going to link down a video that kind of goes more in depth in the issues with suburban life and how it can be really isolating and it was a super interesting video I definitely recommend watching it especially because a lot of suburbs the way that they're planned out you have like homes here and then you have like a mall and everything so they're not really built in a way that facilitates community interaction especially like I said there's a reliance on cars so there's not much of like walking down the street to the grocery store and saying hi to your neighbor and everything like that you definitely ju you just like get in your car and then you drive to the store and then you drive back it's a lot more like isolating and you don't really have as much like culture and access to things like that in general um living in the suburbs not sustainable but what about living in the city. Why is city life more sustainable? So before we transition to talking about living in the city, I thought this would be the perfect time to talk about urban blight and white flight. Oh my god, that rhymes. So white flight, it's kind of exactly as it sounds, but it was, or actually is, white people leaving the cities and moving to the suburbs. And this is more specifically true with affluent white people. But as I mentioned in my video on environmental racism, Jesus, let me film. But as I mentioned in my video on environmental racism, which I'm going to link up here, white people of all income levels have more access to be able to escape to the suburbs than people of color, specifically black people. In the description of that video, I linked an article that kind of touches on that, but that is just in case someone wants to comment down below, but yeah. The white fly is something that um, I don't, I honestly don't think it still really happens today. I guess you'd see more of like within a city, people who have more money just moving to richer areas of cities, especially like New York or Chicago. But um, back in the day, white flight was kind of a response to desegregation because white parents thought it was cringe to send their kids to schools where black people also were. But the issue of white flight is closely tied to the desegregation of schools and more specifically the issue of school busing, which was a response to the de facto segregation that was happening as kind of white people were living leaving the suburbs. But because of a conservative majority on the Supreme Court, a um, lot of the school busing issues ended up going conservative obviously and it kind of solidified this de facto segregation and allowed the people who are escaping or the white people specifically who are escaping to the suburbs it allowed them to be able to not 
have to actually engage with um, desegregation until much much later so that was kind of a tangent but <laughs> okay so back to the issue of white flight um at first it doesn't seem like a big deal like if the white people want to leave the city then so what let them leave but it had a lot of domino effects that have led to the degradation that we see in inner city areas to this day so i talked a little bit about the digital segregation oh i used the wrong word i meant de facto okay um shall anyway so the fact of segregation is basically so the way you can think about it is segregation that happens not because of specific laws so oftentimes people will say like segregation in practice so it's basically how laws are applied or kind of loopholes i guess people will use to be able to practice segregation without it being like a government official being like yes we're going to be segregated so the white flight kind of led to de facto segregation because like i said white people were more likely to be able to escape to the suburbs but you had other things like redlining housing covenants and the way that government housing loans were distributed that kind of worked together to perpetuate this inequality between who got to be able to afford these homes versus who had to stay in the cities and Obviously the who in the situation is black people got to stay in the city and white people got to move to the suburbs. And the Supreme Court kind of upheld these, especially when we look at the decisions on school busing. So we could have been able to reverse a lot of the discrimination and be a lot more far ahead when it comes to equality today. But because of the Supreme Court decisions, to this day, we see the negative impacts of the white flight and the um, the zero and de facto segregation in the cities today. And we see how these systems of repression kind of collapse and basically broke cities. So long story short, the history of segregation, racism, and housing discrimination has led to the degradation of cities, which is what we refer to as urban blight or urban decay. The kind, there's, it's the same thing. And I'm going to put up some pictures to kind of show what exactly it looks like, but it's basically just abandoned, run down, I guess like crime infected. It's basically like, um, you know, like the euphemism for black, how it's like urban. Well, that's kind of basically it. And it's just really important to kind of consider how we got here because a lot of it does have to do with the laws and regulations that were put in place back in the 50s and 60s that kind of perpetuated the inequality and has led to this kind of um, living situation for people living in urban areas. And the other frustrating thing for me personally, not me personally, because I actually am pretty privileged. I um, have never, like I don't come from like Camden or Camden? Wait, Compton. See, I'm a pretty privileged person. So a lot of times when it comes to urban blight, it only happens in certain areas. It happens in the areas that um, black people or people of color are living. And then you have other parts of the city where there's um, more affluent people. This You see this in every basically every major city in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, all of them, where the more obviously affluent parts of the city are doing fine. But then you have the rundown parts of the city and the industries that have been most negatively impacted. Those are the places where people of color are living. And and like I've um, shown, this is kind of a culmination of all of the kinds of um, systems of oppression and also just like the history that we have with <laughs> kind of making life harder for black people for no reason. And also a, p a part of sustainability, a lot of people forget, is also about social well-being. And if you have these areas that have been abandoned, that have been destroyed, the people there aren't really having a good time. So we definitely need to be working to improve these areas in cities. And also obviously investing in the schools because that's another big part. I'm going to try to, I, we watched this really good video in one of my classes about um housing and it was basically comparing i think it was like in rhode island rhode island it was like a, it was like two different school district um one was predominantly black the other was predominantly white and just kinds of the 
the blatant <laughs> difference between these two school districts and it was just super crazy to see so i'm gonna link down that documentary if i can find it or i think it was an article actually i can't remember but yeah i do think it's important for us to kind of invest in these um areas because poverty creates crime and if you don't believe that then you're racist period and also just as a side note gentrification is a real thing and i do think it's important that even when we're going into these areas and trying to fix them up that we don't end up alienating the people that actually live there so this we need to just be very careful i just think it's really important that we actually work to redevelop the areas that have been negatively impacted by urban blight and you might be wondering amy how do we how do we do that <laughs> i don't know i didn't study urban planning i studied politics so all i learned is how to argue my opinion so don't know what to tell you anyways so let's talk about urban planning <laughs> So moving on from talking about the suburbs and urban blight and all that, we're going to be talking about cities and why they are sustainable, but also how we need to think about urban planning to make sure that we can take advantage of the denser population in cities so that they can be as sustainable as possible because, you know, that's the goal. Okay, so mixed zoning. I I tried to find the technical term for this, but I kept coming up with different things, but I just call it mixed zoning or mixed mixed use zoning or mixed use development whatever the correct terminology is it's basically the holy grail of sustainable development and if you don't get anything else from this video it's the importance of mixed zoning and this is something that the u.s just absolute trash have we just cannot get this figured out i don't know who is planning our cities but they need to be fired so this is something that we can actually use in suburbs because like i said we don't all need to be moving to cities but at the very least we need to be creating mixed use zoning living spaces and this is like i said something you can do in the suburbs but it's also just perfect for cities because of this dense population so what exactly is mixed zoning so it's basically creating cities where everything that you need is within walking or busing distance preferably just walking distance so what this looks like is you have your post office down the street your grocery store around the corner your school's like five maybe 10 minutes away you have a, another grocery store down the other street your plant favorite plant store is like right around the corner basically everything that you need to use on a daily or weekly basis is pretty easy to get to and it's pretty close preferably walkable so i'm currently living in paris and paris is just amazing when it comes to mixed zoning i live in the 16th arrondissement which is actually notorious for kind of being more residential and not being close to things and even I'm able to get to most of the places that I need to get to. I have my grocery store, which is I think like 10 minutes away from me, the one that I use. But there's like five grocery stores that are closer. I just don't want to use those grocery stores because they're more expensive. There's like a bookstore I know down the street. It's French snow, so <laughs> not helpful to me. Um, there's also like three schools that I've passed just going in various directions. Um, what else? Oh, parks. I didn't mention that earlier, but having parks really close by or recreation facilities like gyms there's a park like down the street that way it's actually like a huge super beautiful park I'm pretty sure there's like a gym close to me I'll have to google maps that but obviously we're in the middle of the pandemic so not going to gyms but basically what I'm saying is where I'm living right now I can get to anywhere I need to go within a walking distance and if that's not possible then I can just take the metros but in general I just have things close to me versus when I was living in my hometown the closest grocery store let me try to see if just give me a second I'm trying to see how far away the grocery store was from my house the closest grocery store to me was 23 minutes and I don't even really I never used hy because it was kind of expensive and I'd say I live in kind of a similar kind of a similar area kind of not downtown so you would think that there would be something close for me and it's similar in um minneapolis when i was living in minneapolis it's kind of a similar story where all of the grocery stores close to me were kind of expensive but the closest like affordable grocery store was it was 30 minutes on the metro basically what i'm trying to say is american cities need to 
kind of fix their whole layout situation because it's hard to get to places without driving and like I mentioned earlier reliance on driving is just not very sustainable so just a couple other things that I wanted to touch on like this video is getting through I've been talking for almost an hour but a couple other things that I wanted to touch on when it comes to sustainable housing is um, what you have inside I kind of mentioned this making sure that you're not like filling up your home with things that you don't need that's not very sustainable um, the appliances I'm gonna touch on energy star and efficiency in the video Video, but appliances are super important because they use so much energy the number of people in your apartment two people in the same apartment is not like twice as sustainable but that it's more sustainable than if those two people lived separate so if you can have like more like if you have like a two bedroom maybe get a roommate it's cheaper and it's more sustainable and also making sure that you're not like cranking up your electric your heat to like 10 degree 10, not to, 10 degrees, that doesn't make any sense. Making sure you're not cranking up your heat too high because that's also very unsustainable. And then finally, tiny homes, which I can't get into. Maybe I'll make a video about tiny homes, but yeah, small space, more sustainable. Let's move on because this video is getting so long. This video was made by Amy Maggie. If you liked what you just saw, make sure to go and check out more of her videos on her YouTube channel. The link is in the description. Otherwise, hope you have a great weekend and I'll see you in two weeks.